uh, our presenter is Mikhail Mikhailov, and uh, uh, he is a uh, graduate of the Faculty of Mathematics and Informatics at Sofia University and has since worked as an infrastructure engineer, a database admin, a cloud engineer, and is now DevOps at uh, MariaDB Enterprise. Uh, he is passionate about uh, free and open source software and has come to share with us the, his knowledge about uh, managing multi-cloud and multi-cluster systems with uh, Kubernetes and Thanos. Uh, so, go ahead, take it away. Thank you. Um, yeah, thanks for the great introduction. Uh, yeah, so uh, my name is Mikhail Mikhailov. I will be talking about multi-cloud and multi-cluster monitoring with Kubernetes and Thanos. And before I begin, I just want to make a quick note. Why am I making this lecture in English? It's not out of respect for the one Englishman in the crowd. It's more selfish than that. It's because I've also applied for a KubeCon in Paris next year <laughs> to present the lecture, so hope it goes well. What can you expect from uh, this talk? And I, I plan to make a, a mixture of a deep dive into what observability and monitoring in particular is, what needs it solves, and uh, so on and so forth. And also would like to make it a case study, a case study of our needs at MariaDB and how we managed to address them. At the end, I hope that you are as, as inspired as I was when I started working on this, and maybe you can uh, implement some of the stuff I mentioned in your environment. Yeah, so first, I would like to start with the need, about the need for observability. And also, um, yeah, often I see this picture right here, our infrastructure as this big structure, this big house that is, uh, is being held by several pillars, and those pillars are the pillars of, of observability. Um, many of you may know some of them, monitoring, walking, tracing, Profiling is a relatively new concept. I'll get to this later. And monitoring, basically this system collects your metrics. And I want to say that metrics, those, these are facts. These are digestible small facts. They do not answer complex questions. They do not hold information about complex questions like why is my application down? Uh, they say just your application is down. The memory is high, not high, the memory is this much. There has been three restarts, and you can correlate between the metrics, and for this, we use dashboards, we use, we use predefined alerts, and monitoring collects these small facts and displays them for you. On the other hand, you may expect uh, to find such complex information in the logging system. For example, it's not uncommon to see I'm, I'm shutting down because there's not enough memory in some of the walks. And at this point, I just want to say that it's very important to actually structure your walks relatively equal to the same way that you structure your metrics. I mean, if you assign labels and tags to your metrics, you should be able to assign the same labels and tags to your traces, to your logs, to your profiles, so that you can correlate between all of them. This makes it a lot easier. And tracing, we usually use traces uh, for performance monitoring. In the microservices world, in, ideal, in the perfect case, um, every app can uh, issue traces. The tracing system collects them. You can traverse between all the, the information there. You can see how one a request, um, yeah, one request spend each how much seconds or milliseconds each application spent at each point, and you can find the bottleneck. And profiles, like I said, this is very relatively new concept. Um, for those of you who have experience with Golang, basically you can make um, a Golang profile to your memory to see which functions are using what, uh, how much memory at what exact moment. And the profiling system basically can give you Imagine a system that can store this information 
and display it for you. Basically, you can actually see just seconds, milliseconds before the system went down because of high memory, what was the application using. But this is very complex and this is very uh, deep troubleshooting. I will focus on this presentation about uh, mainly in the first pillar, the monitoring pillar. And when people think of monitoring, maybe most of the time they think of alerting. But it's not only that. It's not only alerts. We do not use monitoring just to see that there is a, a problem. We also use it to troubleshoot the problem, to collect contextual information, to, to dig deep. Then we can also, we should be able to also see back in time. This is also a historical platform. We also should be able to search for trends. For example, uh, now the disk space is 90%. Is there an issue? I don't know. I should be able to see it back every day in the last one month if the daily increase of the disk space is like with 1%, then definitely there's an issue. This is a trend. And decision making, we also use monitoring for yeah, decision making, basic analysis. I sometimes get asked by top management like super complex questions like how much our new version of this particular app costs for the high paid clients. And if you don't have a reliable system to, to check for each and every fact in this sentence, I don't know where else can you check. And in terms of automation, this is a topic that I'm particularly very passionate about. So in Kubernetes, for example, there is this object, uh, the horizontal pot auto scaler, in which you can feed monitoring metrics to actually make autom automatic, <laughs> sorry, uh, yeah, you know what I mean to make decisions automatically. <laughs> and in terms of memory, this is a very good example because if we know, if, we, if the memory has very steadily been increasing for some time, we may uh, trigger some automation response using the uh, metric we feed to the horizontal pot auto scale to scale horizontally. It's very easy. So why we need it? a second version of our observability and in particular monitoring system at MariaDB when I started working there. So I joined, I think maybe a year and a half ago and I was, I started working in, in this database as a service team and database as a service is basically database <laughs> as a service. It's a SaaS platform uh, that we develop in multi-cloud environments and we, we spin up clusters, Kubernetes clusters, for most of our high-paid customers. And on those clusters, we uh, spin up databases. We provide this, this whole thing as a, as a service to clients. And as you may imagine, we end up with a lot of clusters, like at one point, thousands of clusters. And we are multi-cloud. So this, is, this makes the complexity uh, and on a, uh, yeah, on a second degree, and imagine adding new clouds to this. And also, in one cluster, there's not only the database that we have to monitor, we also have this custom resource definitions operator, MariaDB operator that spins uh, and does its thing. Also have site application, microservice applications that do the authentication, authorization, so on and so forth. So we have a lot of metrics, a lot of different environments. And back at the days, in the central, sorry, central monitoring version one, we only had this like super simple setup, only based on Prometheus. And I'm a big fan of Prometheus, as you may see. <laughs> so it's, it's like the most wonderful tool, but it does not scale. It scales to a, to a point and then it becomes really a hell. And it's basically not highly available you have your data on disk, which again is a no-no when you, when, in terms of scalability. And because the data is on disk, and this is, this is expensive, uh, we, you should, we only have like two weeks of data. It's a limit, there is a limit, there's a physical limit to this. The data is duplicated and it's not really centralized. Adding new clouds, adding new regions, at some point uh, we ended up with different URLs, different subsystems, 
it 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 was a hell. And I um yeah, I forgot to mention that for those of you who do not know what federated Prometheus means, it means that for every client we have like separate Prometheus instance, every cluster, and for example, as as I said, we had like one thousand clusters. We have 1,000 Prometheus high availability pairs, which are not really highly available, which were being scraped, which were, their information were being copied to, to only two Prometheus instances. And this was like the big monolith application. So we started thinking what we need, what we, what we want for our next system. And we ended up with this list. First of all, as you may imagine, I say that like several times, uh, this new system has to be scalable. We may add new clouds, we may add new regions, it has to be scalable. And scalable not vertically, it has to be scalable horizontally. Of course, it has to be cost efficient because at one point, it, beca it becomes like this huge monster that the customer has to pay. And storage, Disk storage is expensive. Block storage is cheap. When you assign memory, you should not over provision. You should assign the exact amount of memory that your application needs. That's the perfect scenario and then scale horizontally. And also at one point, we managed to actually spin up the like half of the infrastructure of this monitoring system in spot instances. And Many of you might know that spot instances actually are very, very cheap. Like one fourth of a new, uh, one fourth of the price of a regular instance at, at worst. Then traffic in this multi-cloud, super complex environment, microservices. You know, the traffic is a big issue, and it's very big cost, uh, yeah, cost concern, and so on and so forth. So it has to be easy to use because because we build a system that has to be used not only by the, by the SRE team. It has to be used by other teams. It has to be easy to use. It has to be automated. As I said, adding new clouds, adding new zones, new clusters in this um, distributed setup has to be automated. And by the way, this is like the most important thing because if it's not fast, if it's not uh, does not have the sufficient amount of historical information that everyone needs. If it's not reliable, if it's not accurate, then there is no point of building super complex stuff if you do not actually trust on them. And my, my biggest example here is if you check your application, is it, is it up or not in one minute interval or two minutes, this is not enough. It has to be, you, we have to be better than that. It has to be structured um, because building dashboards, building alerts, you just, uh, there's no point of having alerts if they are not complete. So I've mentioned here several um, methods that you can use to structure your monitoring. Use black box monitoring. That this means basically in our world when we monitor databases, this means has, can the user make a select statement? If the user can make, can make a select statement, then database works, and everything between the database and the end user works. White box monitoring means you, also we have to check every site service. Also, we have to check every component as a separate component within and without, uh, with, yeah, as a whole and within. Red and use are very, <coughs> sorry, are two very uh, popular methods of actually structuring your alerts and dashboards. Red means rate, error, and duration. And use means utilization, saturation, and errors. Red dashboards, rates, errors, and duration, you almost always see on dash dashboards and alerts that are more application specific, that may concern the application team, and the utilization, saturation, and errors are something that us, the SRE team, are very fond about. And the biggest bane in the monitoring world is the alert fatigue. I, I, I think how best to describe it, and maybe um, too much alerts, too much 
non-actionable uh, alerts and too much auto-resolving alerts. These two, th sorry, these three factors combined can cause people to lose, um, yeah, people to lose confidence in the system and also at one point you just simply stop watching it because too much alerts, you cannot do anything about them. And of course you have to be able to centralize things, you have to be able to provide decent, decent amount of authentication, of authorization, uh, yeah, because even though those are metrics and some of them are obscured, there is some sensitive information out there. Okay, so at this point, <laughs> I, I, I assume some of you may have fallen asleep. This is like a quick uh, sneak peek of actually why this a platform like this one can be useful. And this is like uh, collect some several snapshots from our production system, uh, oh, sorry, staging system. And uh, of course, um, so imagine being paged at 1 a.m. by pager duty or something. And you have to respond. And the first thing you see, of course, is the alert. This is, these are two different alerts from Slack. You see, with one sentence, you know what is going, what is going, what is going on. Pot is in waiting state. Pot has terminated. Then we know where, with bullet point styles, like AWS, prod, specific cluster. And then the most genius part is that we know how to proceed. In this, so in this example, we have several buttons that give us, gives us different action points. For example, if we know that this, uh, someone else is working at this point, there is a maintenance window, something like that, we just can silence, silence it, therefore reduce the noise. And this is an example, when you click, click on the silence button, you actually get um, Pre-filled information, you can silence this specific alert or maybe even the whole cluster just by uh, removing the selectors here. But then again, we may want to see what's going on. So the dashboards is like the most useful button here. Dashboards, when you click on the button, there is the information is pre-filled, so you do not have to select or filter down the cluster. Um, also, you have all the con contextual information. Maybe the pod is down, but let's see how the disk space is doing. What, what's the memory footprint or something like that. It's foldable. <laughs> this is very interesting because now I see namespace system is okay. Let's see how the, the rest are doing. I can just simply fold this information. And they are structured in a good way with this one with use method. And finally, you, you have to take action. So what are the next steps? The next steps, yeah, if you are like the super SRE ninja, you remember everything in your mind, but at 1 a.m. it's hard to think how to react. So um, this is a very good example of a well-structured runbook. It's done by Prometheus operator. And in this example, you see the meaning of the alert, then what's the impact, how to diagnose actually what's going on, and then how to mitigate the issue. And <clears throat> sorry, this demo is how uh, Grafana, this is done by Grafana Labs. Imagine um, there are two systems of the uh, their observability stack, log is for metrics, Prometheus is for logs, how they can interact with each other to provide us with a, with a very good um, user experience. So they have this dashboard for the demo application, which as many of you may see, um, the app is has uh, HTTP requests with 500 response code, which basically means there are errors. So what do we do next? We want to dig deep. We want to see what's the issue. So in Grafana, you do that with Explore. You just see the metric, see what's behind the labels, which is the app. Um, and But then again, this is not enough. We want to see all the developers may, may know you want, we want to see the box. We want to see the exact, the, the exact error. So you select a particular in, uh, period in time. And this is the genius part. You just simply click on the next system, the, the logging system, Loki, and everything has been uh, tr transformed. The selectors are being transformed. And you see the logs for this particular application. 
And of course, it's not enough because now we have 1,000 logs. We also may want to filter this and only get the errors. So <clears throat> at this example, just have a simple grep. In Loki, you basically can do grep uh, and just grep for error. And now we see the actual issue is empty URL. This is a, good, <clears throat> this is a very good example how from uh, Slack alert, we can go next to see dashboard, we can see logs and then find the issue in no time. Okay, so, but what we built in MariaDB is a very good example of how you can incorporate the good practices with an environment that is very scalable and very complex. As I said before, Prometheus is not enough at this case. We um, had to use had to choose a better solution, not not per se a better solution, but something that fits our needs. And for this, we chose Thanos. Many of you may know Thanos is uh, it's it's not uh, something that is different from Prometheus. It's something that you can augment Prometheus. You can enhance Prometheus with. And yeah, I have I I have no plans of actually explaining further about Thanos because. I've done um, a very de detailed presentation in the Quant Native and uh, Platform Engineering Meetup in Bulgaria several years ago. Check this out. Um, but at this point, I want to say why we needed Thanos. It's first of all because of the long, <coughs> long-term st storage support. So at this point, we decided we do not want metrics on um, on disks. We want metrics on uh, buckets. Then we want to also have a global view. We have this. Uh, AWS clusters, GCP clusters, whatever we want to see, to see them in one place, we want to select them in one place. Then also we have to be able to scale horizontally. That's a no, no brainer, right? Then Thanos provides us with all these possibilities, and then we want to downsample and deduplicate, because we also have a lot of duplicate information, and Thanos actually can provide us with this uh, feature for. Historical data, we do not want samples on a 10 seconds rate. We want samples for one day for, or for several hours, whatever. And yeah, very um, cool feature is also that you can actually um, distribute workload between different uh, Thanos queries. This is the tool that actually queries stuff. And you can cache queries, which can save a lot of memory and processing power. Quick, so quick explanation. What is the difference between and Thanos and Prometheus? Uh, sorry, Tha yeah, Prometheus and Thanos. Basically, Prometheus is a monolith. So this is like this cool Golang application, which has a lot of features. And these are the four main functions that Prometheus has: it scrapes, so it checks for things. Then it stores and compacts the data in TSDB blocks. Then uh, out of this data, it can create alerts or rules. And it also gives you the ability to actually query this data that it has on this disk to see stuff. Thanos <coughs> takes each and every uh, function and makes it highly scalable, makes it basically microservices, micro microservice oriented. So <coughs> at the end of the day, we end up with this super complex diagram. I Truly, I hate diagrams, so, but I could not think of a better way of describing this. This is a regional setup of Thanos. What this means is like for every region, we have clusters in database clusters. We have one of those. This is like one piece of the whole infrastructure. It's not the whole infrastructure. But um, yeah, every, so basically, let's, let's see if I can show you. Basically, these are Prometheus instances on every cluster of our um, every database cluster. They send information to Thanos. Thanos collects it, stores it in block storage. Then also we can compact compact it over time, uh, ag ag aggregate it, down compress it, everything. And also you can uh, make it sorry, it, it can make it uh, queryable by multiple. Instances all over the, our clouds, multi-cloud, basically, it can make it multi-cloud. What <clears throat> I want to say at this point is that the genius, in my opinion, thing that we managed to do is to define different, um, different priority paths. So having a microservice-oriented architecture actually gives you 
um, microservices, right? So, but the, some of those microservices are more important than others. For example, we do not want to lose metrics. So the ingestion path, path, this is the blue, sorry, this is the blue path. The ingestion path is the most important. And we, we use Kubernetes for this one because Kubernetes has a lot of objects like uh, pod disruption budgets, like priority class, topology spread constraint, to actually say this is our most priority-based application. Do not disturb it unless it's very important. And the rest of them, they have different impact. For example, we do not want to um, have downtime of the querying function, but it's, it's okay, right? Because eventually we will have this uh, ability. So that way we actually achieve a higher degree of scal sorry, scalability, no, but a higher degree of uh, actually um, chaos engineering within the service automatically. And this is the biggest, the big picture. I, I, what I described here is like only this regional Thanos instance. As you see, this is in one zone in AWS. In every zone in which we have databases, we should be able to have um, instances of, of, of our monitoring, one or, uh, or, or more. At the end of the day, we can add new instances, we can add new clouds, we can add new environments, because now we have dev stage test. Maybe we, we want to add sandbox. Maybe we want to add also um, yeah, laptops. Everyone want to yeah, be able to define new instances. First fail. <laughs> We deployed this whole <clears throat> complex environment in staging at one point, and everything was perfect at, up to this day, uh, the 31st of, of October, in which the bill exploded. And we started troubleshooting what happened. What happened was there was a huge traffic to Thanos receivers, and the strange thing was that only several client services were sending this huge traffic. So we continued troubleshooting, and we, we ended up with these these two um, yeah these two settings by the way this screen will be shut in several seconds so <laughs> yeah um, so these two settings as you may imagine they configure the queue and we <clears throat> sorry every database cluster sends information every database Prometheus sends information to our system but if it cannot send it it stores it in the queue and it tries to flush it and the maximum amount of flushing allowed um, before it retries was one, uh, sorry, 10% of a second, which means 10 times a second we tried to flush the whole queue. And this was one whole day of flushing queues. And this, of course, generated huge traffic, which, of course, the traffic was public, so it, it was paid. But the good thing was it, it was on staging, and it's okay. First lesson we learned, keep your services up to date. <laughs> because this is fixed, and I, I spoke with the guys who fixed it, and they said, yeah, that, that's exactly why I fixed it. <laughs> so you have to be able to update. And why only two or several of our clusters had this issue? Because they were, uh, the Prometheus clients were with different version. Then read the documentation, <laughs> because this page in Prometheus, the remote write tuning, has all the answers. We then, after we had this issue, we read it, and everything was plain simple. We had alert for our uh, uh, monitoring. We, we monitor our monitoring, but we did not monitor it. We, don't, we did not have alert for this particular issue. So at the end of the day, we implemented uh, compliant alerts, and now we, we should be able to know everything. When we ended up with this plan, um, fix the queues, filter metrics, because it turned out many of the metrics were like for it, ETCD of the um, GK, which we do not care about. We, we defined rate limiting uh, to not bring Thanos down if so one of our clients have issues. And then we, we defined different alerts and made the traffic private per se. Finally, <laughs> and I'm more passionate about this one because this is how, if this all makes sense, if we are, we are able to scale it because it's good now, but what, what about when MariaDB actually goes <clears throat> like super multi-cloud and has uh, hundred thousands of clusters? What, what we 
uh, we, what, what we can do at this point is have grow the system exponentially, horizontally, and to every code, to every environment. We, <coughs> sorry, we base our infrastructure automation with our, uh, with, yeah, we chose Argo for this, Argo CD, Argo workflow. Basically, if, for example, <coughs> new region appears, and our application, our uh, we, we have new databases in new regions. Then this um, triggers, for example, our CD sensor that can trigger a workflow that can create new cluster, permitted, uh, sorry, Kubernetes cluster. The new Kubernetes cluster, let's see, the new Kubernetes cluster is, is getting, is out-registered in Argo CD. Argo CD then, Argo CD then knows um, this cluster with set of labels. This is the very important part because each cluster has to be able, we, we have to be able to know which environment it is, what kind of cluster it is, to be able to judge what kind of application should be deployed to it. And this all is automatically just by defining the, uh, the labels of the cluster. And at the end of the day, um, Argo CD automatically based on the labels applies new application sets and we have everything on it. And the central monitoring version two environment has been extended. How we <coughs> manage to do this? First of all, um, yeah, we discussed uh, different solutions for the infrastructure as a code part, infrastructure as a code, like the new concept with cross-plane, with cluster API, to have Kubernetes actually make Kubernetes, but um, we were not at actually ready at the time. We chose like more classical approach with Terraform, but we wanted to be cool. We wanted to be, to be more abstract than possible with Terraform, so we chose Terragrunt. Terragrunt, basically, for those of you who do not know, is an abstraction over Terraform that can actually, <coughs> we, you, basically in Terraform we have modules. You can use those modules to abstract different functions, different parts of your infrastructure. But we, with Terragrunt, we can abstract whole environment. And we have this environment, like GCP environment. You have, we, we have new region in GCP. We apply the new Terragrunt code to it and everything runs right. For it, uh, we need to have a different set of values files, different because of course different regions have different demands. Some of them are smaller, some of them are bigger. <clears throat> so we ended up with this um, nested structure of values files. And on top of those clusters, of course, we use Helm Maybe some of you do not know what Helm actually is, but basically every open source project these days have, um, as, have um, as part of the, the repo somehow is also maintaining, <coughs> also maintaining uh, a Helm chart. And this Helm chart, so we, we could also use this public Helm charts for our application, for Thanos, for Prometheus, for the logging part, for everything. But here I want to mention the discussion we had about homegrown Helm charts to actually we we managed to work and do the Helm code ourselves or actually use public Helm charts. The public Helm chart, the plus the plus side of actually having public Helm using public Helm charts is um, that you do not have to ma to maintain it. New features get added automatically. You don't have to think about it. The, but the the minus, and it, in our case. In our case, this was the biggest concern, was that this is like this huge application that uh, we only use 5% of it. So we wanted to make it lean. We wanted to make um, it as much consistent with other applications as possible. So we ended up with our homegrown Helm chart applications that were following a style guide. So, for example, you, you define variables the same way, you define functions the same way, so you can expect you're working only on one application, but you expect the others use the same styles. You know. Then you can make linters to check if the style guides are actually <coughs> being followed. You define common helpers. This is abstraction in the Helm chart. And you have a common value structure. And I think at this point, I we will share the second fail. And in this example shows how defining one Helm chart and applying it to many clusters can, in our case, lead to like 
hundreds of virus files. And mm. we ended up hurting virus files. But this was not okay, so we should be able to do better than this. What we did was, sorry, previous lessons. Yeah, what we did was we made it, we uh, made use of the um, must merge override function in Helm, which made us define like this nested values uh, maps. So we have one, one huge map of the defaults. We have nested values of maps, uh, maps of values for each environment, each cloud, each uh, type of application. It was very abstract. It was very easy. This is like, sorry. This is an example. Uh, for example, we want the, the de default for our application in terms of memory is 10 gigabytes. But in our <coughs> environment in Prot, in this the Asia region, we want to be to assign it a little bit more of memory. So we ended up assigning new value only to this environment, and this overrides the default value. It's very easy. It's very uh, like natural. You only, and the, the, the very uh, biggest advantage of this one is actually um, not having to, de to define any values at all because you can use the defaults. All of this is automated, of course, because, yeah, why not? And we use Argo CD for this as well. This is a very good example. This is an application set in Argo CD. And application set basically means a set of applications. Yeah. <laughs> And the set of applications is a bootstrap, so every cluster should have one of those. If the cluster is managed by Argo, as, as I said before, clusters get, get auto-registered or registered in Argo, and then uh, automatically you get assigned all these uh, functions, as you see, uh, auto-scaling, cluster auto scale to spin up new nodes, um, full ND to collect votes, then node exporter, then metric server, or so on and so forth. And I think at this point, yeah, this is a quick example. We have this cluster suspended in Argo. I, at this point, I just, I don't want it suspended anymore. And this automatically triggers by the set of labels installing our Thanos regional setup on this particular cluster. And you can actually, by using the labels, install or deploy whatever you want um, in an automated way even if you don't, don't define the values per se for this applic particular application. So <clears throat> we ended up with a self-sufficient setup, which is very important because, yeah, at, 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 the scale of a, of a, sorry, at a scale of a thousand, we still are able to manage clusters, but at a scale of 100,000, we may not. Then we can scale indefinitely because we scale horizontally. And every environment is has a spin-off of its own, and yeah, and we have the, the, the metrics in, in uh, sorry, the storage in the clouds and buckets. Buckets are cheap; we can scale the buckets if we want. It's consistent. So if we <clears throat> if we add new clouds, if we add new environments, they should mo look more or less the same as the previous one. Yeah, and maybe at this point. Um, yeah, I'm saying a lot of yeah, cool stuff, but at the end of the day, those are more like um, more like sorry um, suggestions to you to think about scale because we ended up the, uh, we ended up needing actually to, sorry we ended up uh, with the desperate need of scale and we were not able to do it. And I think many applications uh, or many teams also has this um, disadvantage because when they work in a simple environment, they do something that works in this environment, per se. But when scale hits them, it's immensely hard to actually scale. So build for scale, build for, <coughs> build, build for scale, build for uh, self-sufficiency, and build for consistency. That's it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mikhail. Um, uh, now we have uh, time for questions. If anybody has any, go ahead uh, to the microphones. Yeah, 
there's a feedback form um, the, with the QR code. You can scan it. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, just one short question. Why did you choose Thanos instead something like Grafana Mimir? Yeah, perfect question. Um, actually, Thanos, Grafana, uh, Thanos, uh, Cortex, yep. Mimir nowadays, at one point in time, they were very different from one another. But nowadays, as you may know, they are very similar. And <clears throat> it was a cognitive decision to use Thanos because we didn't need multi-tenancy at the time. And Mimir and Cortex, Cortex are built for multi-tenancy. And we, we only have one tenant, observability prods uh, or something like that. But <clears throat> just saying that, um, I, I realized, realized that this is not true because nowadays Thanos also has multi-tenancy. So we can use Mimir, we, we can use uh, Cortex also. But yeah, I, I also like Mimir and Cortex as well, but Thanos maybe sounds cool. But back at, back at the time, uh, the tenancy was the primary trigger. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, if there aren't any other questions, uh, let's thank our lecturer again. I'll be switching to Bulgarian for the wrap up. Благодаря ви, че дойдохте и за последната лекция, изобщо че присъствате днес на OpenFest.